I'm Howie Rose, and it's time to go one-on-one -on -one with a member of the 1986 World Champions Mets reliever, Roger McDowell. And Roger, we've got so much ground to cover here. Okay. But where I want to start <laughs> is with the aura that you and so many of the other guys from the 86 team who come back here still have. The way you're received, the way you're treated. What do you get? What do you hear and actually uh, get in terms of conversation from people when you meet them around the ballpark here? Uh, it was like yesterday. We got to uh, have interactions with the fans a little bit, Doc and I, and uh, speaking and you know, signing some autographs and getting to talk to them. And, and, and that's what they talked about is that, you know, hey, I was there. I remembered 86. You know, I remembered the, you know, the Three Stooges and, and, <laughs> and, and everything that uh, you know, was a part of that year, uh, part of that season, uh, the, the, uh, the playoffs games uh, with the Astros, um, obviously the World Series, but uh, just – I guess the, just the joy of the year. I mean, it was every night, 50, 55,000, you know, fans uh, in the stadium, and it didn't matter whether who we were playing, what time the game was. I mean, this place was filled, and so you know, it's, it's evolved, uh, and then hopefully the, the, the current uh, club gets an opportunity to win a World Series, but it's the last World Series that uh, the Mets have had. So, I mean, I think there's a special place for a lot of people that, um, you know, grew up in that uh, time frame, grew up in that year. Um, and I think one of the biggest was that that, that game six in, in Houston where it, it lasted forever, basically, and people were, you know, whether they couldn't you know, go home because they didn't want to miss anything, or they went home and the game was still on and they watched it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I mean, I think it was a special time and a lot of people were able to relate to it. One of the reasons, by the way, that the game lasted forever was right here because really it's one of the most, I think, underrated spectacular pitching performances in the history of the New York Mets with the season potentially on the line because nobody wanted to face Mike Scott in right. game seven. It almost felt like a seventh game. Right. Five shutout, one hit innings effectively in sudden death against the Astros. Do you consider that the signature performance of your career? I would have to. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't particularly good in the World Series. Jesse saved me uh, a couple times and actually saved me in game seven when uh, you know, I think we had a three-run lead and I gave up yeah. two and we had to, they had a tying run at second base with nobody out. I would probably say that was one of the more uh, defining moments in, in my career, being able to uh, contribute um, in that game, in that way. I remember before the series started, and this was, I don't remember how many years the USA Today had been out. Uh, how, well, by 86, how, I think it was about those, three or four years. Not but but it, was, it, was, it was the read, you know? And so you get up and you, you turn the sport, sports section and, you know, uh, I remember very vividly that there was a, a, a little a blurb in there, uh, three or four sentences of how I did against the Astros. You know, one of the keys was how I did against the Astros during the regular season, which wasn't particularly good. And you know, it might have been an 0 and 2 or 0 3, maybe an 0 and 4 record. And I think my ERA was around 12 um, during the regular season against. And, you know, it, it didn't matter who it was, whether it was Dickie Thon or Kevin Bass or, or Craig Reynolds or, or Glenn Davis, um, Jose Cruz, those guys, uh, Alan Ashby, um, they, they all had a way of, of hitting well against me. So that being said, you know, the five innings, yeah, uh, to be able to do that in that environment, uh, knowing that, uh, you know, we did have the possibility of facing uh, Mike Scott the next day, he'd already beaten us twice. Um, and uh, did not want to face that, but uh, knowing that the game was over, if, if they score a run. Uh, fortunately, I had some good defensive plays behind me, and a terrific defense. Uh, you know, I think it was Elster at shortstop, made a couple good plays. Keith made a couple good plays. Uh, the base hit, I think it was Kevin Bass had the base hit in the, the 13th, the two outs in the 13th, and Gary threw him out at second base. Um, and so, um, I relied a lot on, on defense, and we had a good defense. Unfortunately, the Astrodome at that time, uh, the, the balls that were hit were hit at, at uh, our guys. You, if you are a fan and go back that far, you remember the tension. You remember the nervousness. You remember the panic every time an Astro reached base, or a Met failed to for that reason. But what was it like in the dugout, inning by inning, as you knew what was at stake, you'd shut them down, You'd sit down for however long it took the Mets to go through the top yeah. of the next inning. But 
What was the dugout like? Was it tense? Was it loud? Was it quiet? It was, I mean, it was the Astrodome. I mean, in that I place, that place was packed. Yeah. And it, I mean, you couldn't hear yourself think. And I mean, it's been so long. I mean, you, you remember certain things. I think probably the only thing I remember is, am I going to get in that bat? <laughs> you know, am I, am I going to get in that bat in this? And I did. I, uh, I think it was Larry Anderson, uh, slider Larry Anderson that's always through. And uh, it didn't matter if you were, you know, a pitcher, or Roger McDowell or Keith Hernandez or Gary Carter. Um, you were going to get sliders, and, and I ended up grounding out to second base. And, you know, th that was I wanted, to, I wanted to get a hit more than anything. Um, Pitchers, in, man, they're all alike. <laughs> I wanted to get a hit in, in the playoffs, and uh, I wanted to get a hit in the World Series. And, uh, so did you one. somehow feel unfulfilled at the end of all of it? Um, no. That ring has a way of no, canceling yeah, all that Yeah, the ring out, has a way of doing, uh, you know, making, making good things happen and make you feel good. Well, I mentioned that the Mets might not have gotten that ring if not for Roger McDowell, but it really was only a year before when it seemed that your career took a rather drastic change of direction in the sense that you had, what was it, elbow surgery, mm -hmm. and when you came through the surgery and started throwing again, all of a sudden you found sink in your ball that you didn't think you had earlier in your career. How did yeah. that happen? Yeah, well, I had always thrown a sinker. Um, it was uh, presented to me or... or shown to me by a, a bird dog scout when I was in high school by the name of Larry Grafer uh, with the Philadelphia Phillies. And uh, I'd always had a sinker. My hand, hand wasn't big enough, um, I felt, to, to throw a, a four-seam fastball, and I didn't throw it very hard anyway. And so you know, he showed me a, a sinker grip, and I started throwing that. And, uh, and then uh, after I got drafted, I went to college, got drafted, Went to the minor leagues, 83, um, at the end of the year, um, I had feeling pain in my elbow, um, came up to see the doctors here in New York, and I believe it was on uh, Valentine's Day, February 14th was when I had the surgery to remove uh, 13 bone chips uh, from my elbow and my, uh, the outside, the, the posterior part of my forearm. And so, Went through the season, rehabbed in Jackson, Mississippi, um, and that's where I was at the previous year. So I rehabbed there. I, I knew the trainers and uh, the coaches, and, and so um, rehabbed there and was able to pitch the last part of the year there uh, in their playoffs, uh, the, the year that they won the Texas League Championship. Uh, from there, I went to um, Instructional League and uh, Davey and the contingent of the Major League staff and the scouts all came down to watch Instructional League. and. Um, everybody was there, and, and I pitched uh, instructionally. But I did have a different sinker. Um, you're totally correct um, because I had a freer arm. Um, there were times when I wasn't able to, to get my arm much past um, 75 degrees. And so after the surgery, because of the removal of the bone chips and the spurs and all the loose cartilage and all the loose impediments in there, um, I, I had freedom to get extension on my arm, and I guess that translated into a better sinker. So um, it's a pitch that I um, uh, it got me in the big leagues, uh, kept me in the big leagues, and uh, had um, you know, had a 12-year career. And the success with that pitch and the success in the big leagues came pretty much right away in 1985 when you came up to the Mets. And it didn't take long either for your rather playful persona <laughs> to present itself. That was such a part of Roger McDowell in terms of when people think about your career, all the funny stuff that you did. How did that develop to where you got comfortable as a young, relatively inexperienced player having that much fun when maybe some of the other people in the dugout wouldn't have appreciated it or understood it? Well, I think, you know, I, I think one of the things and I learned along the way was Davey Johnson says, you know, there was a time and a place. The one part was I had to be comfortable from the standpoint of belonging in the big leagues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, at the time, I was a kid. Um, I got told on April 1st uh, at Miller Huggins, uh, it was myself and Calvin Schiraldi and Bill Latham and Rick Aguilera all slated to go to AAA and be a part of that starting pitching staff. And um, because of the injury to Brent Gaff, um, late in the spring training, uh, there were ten pitchers, and they had already there were already ten. You you, you got on the list, and you knew which ten were going 
north with the club. And so we were all, uh, four of us were slated to go to AAA at Tidewater. And uh, when Brent, Brent Gaff got injured, um, they looked, I guess, down the list and so which one would help us and complement what we need and fulfill whatever Brent Gaff may have uh, uh, you know, contributed until he gets back. And so, um, fortunately, I was that guy. Um, got an opportunity to break, break with the club and come north. And uh, you know, getting comfortable being around, you know, traded for Gary Carter, right? 85 mm -hmm. is his first year, uh, my first year. Um, he's an established all-star catcher. Um, Keith Hernandez established first base. He had uh, Backman and I think it was uh, Garden Hire. In 85, Garden in, Hire would have been there, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, uh, you know, you had Ray Knight on the team. You had Howard... Howard Johnson first year, year for Howard, his Howard, yeah. first year, Mookie and Daryl. So you had people that you know, as as a young man coming up to the big leagues, you had people were, that were established. And getting to your point of when did the fun? It, it it got fun after I felt that I belonged, and I felt like I was a part of the team. And I, and I got my paycheck. That helps. <laughs> you know? and, 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 you know, it's a lot of things that uh, were, were the masks, were props that you would use, whether it was, you know, reminding you of somebody on the team and kind of having some, uh, some levity with a situation and being able to go out and purchase some items that, <laughs> that, that were, really, that were part of, you know, that process. You know, you, you'd be able to... You so know, you'd be a regular at novelty in, stores in, if you could find it. novelty stores, you know, there's a, there's a great masquerade shop in L.A. on Sunset. I don't know if it's still there, but uh, I used to go there all the time because they had, they had movie masks. Um, and so these were masks that either they were, you know, copies of what were made in the movies. Um, but they were, they were high-end masks. And so I loved, I loved Halloween masks. And I would be able to go there and because I was in the big leagues and because I was having some success and I was able to stay and get a regular paycheck that, you know, had some substance to it. I'm able to buy mm -hmm. uh, some of these things. So, no. um, but I think it, was, it goes back to when I was a kid and my dad, um, my dad always, you know, he liked to make people laugh. I guess it's some, somewhere I got it from him. Paranoia being what it is. This is the third <laughs> time I'm checking my shoes. Well, that was Howard. That there. was Howard Johnson brought that over from Detroit. And, and I had always heard about the hot flare. And, and, I, and, and they said, well, Howard's the guy that you need to see. And so I talked to Howard, you know, Hojo, and Hojo goes, yeah, I'll show you. And so he showed me, and I go, you know, it was, it was like, there's a better way. And so I came up with a better way because the way that, you know, um, he showed me, I was like, you know what? There is. There has to be a better way. Well, you did a beautiful demonstration, so, the two of you. In the yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and and when I showed Howard, I said, Howard, look, look what, look what I found. I found the better <laughs> way to the hot foot. And he goes, Raj. He goes, you have like the first four or five innings. He goes, sometimes I got to play all nine. <laughs> he goes, so pressure's so, on now. So you know, he goes, you know, when Ray's playing, I'll help you. <laughs> It was fun. Well, how did Bill Robinson, the beloved hitting coach and first base because coach, how did Uncle because, Bill become your favorite target? Because he was the dare. Don't, don't ever get me. Don't you ever oh, get really? me. And it, was, it was a challenge. You know, and he, and he kind of challenged, uh, <laughs> challenged the hot foot. And so whenever, uh, whenever you were able to get Bill, and, and I, the one I loved the best was the one in Cincinnati uh, where – um, Pete Rose at the time was a player manager, and Pete, uh, the old ballpark in Cincinnati, the, you remember the coaching boxes were, were relatively close to the bench. Um, and so when Bill went over to first base, and you know, this, is, you know, this is like those uh, shows, uh, those fishy shows, they, they take about three days to film, right? And they get 30 minutes of, of, of work. Well, this was probably... 15, 20 times just trying to get built to get it to go out to the f first base, you know, have it, uh, you know, have the fuse still lit, have it smoke, have uh, uh, Webby, the director, Bill Webb, yeah. have him know about it so he can get it. 
I mean, th this was a production. This was well organized. Yeah, pretty much. And so, uh, you know, when it finally happened, and Pete Rose was the player manager at the time with the Reds, and he saw what was going on. And so he took all of his guys down by the first base coaching box at that end of the dugout <laughs> so that everybody could enjoy. And, I mean, that was that's probably the, the, the number one uh, hot foot that, uh, that I was able to give. You got him more than once, though, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Bill? Yeah, but that was so the much one. For daring you. Yeah, that was yeah. the one. And and you know, I remember. I don't, I don't know if it was after that time, but I remember coming out for batting practice here, uh, well at Shea, and he had all my shoes uh, on top of the the top step of the dugout. And I don't know <laughs> if anybody remembers this, but he he had gotten some lighter fluid, and uh, timed it uh, so that when I came out of the runway up to go out for batting practice, uh, the pitcher's batting practice, he had lit the entire <laughs> stack of shoes on fire. Um, so that was his way of getting back. But uh, he, was, he was such a good-natured person. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things that, that our whole team was, from the, the manager, Davey Johnson, to the coaching staff, to the players, we all were able to um, have fun with each other um, in, in a lot of different uh, ways and, and avenues. Uh, but when it time, came time to play ball, we were all in. And it's material like this that gives you a national image and persona because becoming the second spitter on Seinfeld does not happen, I don't think, unless you would made a career of giving hot foots or hot feet and accomplishing what you did in that department. So how did Seinfeld evolve from everything else? I was, I was at home one winter, and um, I think it was the second year of Seinfeld. And, and Keith lived in the city. He knew Larry David. He knew Jerry uh, Seinfeld. And, and Jerry had come out to the games. I don't know if, if Larry David had come out to the games. But anyway, um, they had written this spoof off the JFK second shooter, and mm -hmm. so they got the second spitter. And Keith said, you know, Roger would be a good guy for that, didn't fit, and that's how that happened. So I got to go fly out to L.A., and Keith and I, and uh, I, I hadn't really watched the show um, because I think it was the second season. I think they had Pretty their, early, their, yeah. their, their early 90s. Their, well, actually, their, I think it was... Was it their third season? By the time in that my... episode rolled on, it's probably about 93, 4, somewhere in there. Yeah, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, you know, it, it hadn't become what it was to become. And so the popularity of it was, all right, you got, you got the following. You know, we'll renew the second year. This is my understanding. I could be totally wrong. Um, but I'm just ad-libbing this as we go here. Works for me. <laughs> so we get out there and... They say, okay, we're going to put you up behind this bush and you're going to need to spit. I said, okay. So probably for the first 15 or 20 times, I actually spit. Uh, and, and, you know, there was no conversation. Were you spitting at Kramer, by the way? or just I was spitting some... in that direction. I think it was, nobody was walking. I think they were just filming me, uh -huh. me spitting, okay? And so after about 15 or 20 times, I said, I'm running out. I got nothing left, you know? <laughs> They said, well, Give me some gum. Let's, let's take a break. You know, is it gum? Or I said, how about some water? That don't, you know. And so uh, that's how it evolved. Uh, and so uh, I would say whenever uh, I've talked, you know, my career, so to speak, it's usually Seinfeld, MTV, Rock and Jock, and then the baseball is after that. Funny how that works, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Well, you got to be known for something. I'd rather, you know, be known for something. Well, you certainly were known for being a Met. And then comes June of 1989, and suddenly, not only are you traded, you're traded to a team you had just played mm -hmm. that afternoon. You're leaving a bunch of guys you had, in part, grown up with, right. and suddenly you're not part of them anymore. What was that like? Uh, devastating. I remember uh, going into Davy's office. It was, uh, it was Father's Day, 1989, uh, Sunday, and... I don't, I don't remember whether we won or lost the game. I, I think we may have lost that game. Um, but I went into Davy's office, and Len, both Lenny and I went into Davy's office, and, and I really don't remember who was there other than Davy and Mel. I remember Davy and Mel being there, and uh, gave us the news that, that we'd been traded. 
um, to the Phillies uh, for Juan Samuel, and that uh, you know, basically just take your stuff over to the, to the other clubhouse. Um, but it was like you said, it was it was the organization that I was I was drafted by, uh, the organization that I had spent uh, time in the minor leagues with, with players in the minor leagues, the, the coaches, the managers, um, come up to the big leagues and uh, you know have have some success in the big leagues and be part of a. A phenomenal team, um, especially 85 to, through 88, um, and win a World Series in 1986, and to not be a part of it anymore, um, it was. Um, at the end of the day, you, you're looking, trying to look at a positive to where um, I wasn't pitching very well. You know that that was that was a fact. I was not pitching very well at all, and so um, uh, I, I lost my end of the the game job, um, even any kind of meaningful innings. And so um, I, I looked at it as an opportunity to go somewhere, um, play for a ball club where I would get an, a chance to pitch at the end of the game. And that was the, I think the same day that they traded Steve Bedrosian uh, to San Francisco. And so Steve Bedrosian was the, the closer in Philadelphia. And so I went from not uh, pitching meaningful innings um, because I was not very successful and because I was not able to get anybody out uh, to go into another organization and have an opportunity um, uh, to pitch those uh, those innings. And before I let you go, you became a coach, mm -hmm. a successful coach for a long time. And for people who would first think of the hijinks and all the shenanigans that went on earlier in your career, that would have been a bit of a leap of faith back in the 1980s sure. to say, hey, Roger McDowell <laughs> right. is lighting up coach's feet, and then he's the going to become a coach. That's the last thing anybody would think of, right? How did it happen? Uh, it happened because I had lived in Southern California. Um, I had known Dave Wallace. Dave Wallace was the assistant general manager with the Los Angeles Dodgers at the time. And I had known Dave Wallace since I played for the Dodgers in the early 90s. And he was the uh, minor league pitching coordinator. And so we knew each other. And um, I was doing some community relations work with the Dodgers. I would go in the ballpark here and there and uh, get to stick around for a game or two. And uh, spoke to Dave Wallace. And, uh, and he asked me if I ever thought about getting back in the game. And, you know, uh, and we've talked about how much I love being on the field, how I think the, the, the field is the best office in the world. Um, and, and it's it's such a joy to, to be a part of it. And so I said, yeah, but I didn't know what in, capa in what capacity. And he said, well, I think you'd be good on the field. And so the next year I got to uh, uh, a short season club that eventually became uh, the low A team in Albany. Um, and I, I think that, that that was one of the things that I had said to him is that I want to start where I started as a player, you know, I want to learn from the, you know, start from the bottom and learn from the bottom up and work my way up like I had to do as a player, uh, and make it, you know, worthwhile and, and not, not to think because I played professional baseball and pitched in the, in the big leagues that I had, had uh, any reason to not start at the bottom. And so worked uh, two years in A-ball. Two years in Las Vegas uh, with a AAA team at the time with the Dodgers, uh, the Las Vegas 51s, and then got an opportunity to go interview with Bobby Cox and John Scherholtz and um, got offered that job in Atlanta and was very fortunate to be in Atlanta for 11 years. It doesn't happen. You know, I mean, as a pitching coach, you just you don't get to stay somewhere for 11 years. Um, and so I was really, really very fortunate that uh, you know, my, we moved my family there, um, and we've we've been there since uh, 2008, and my kids are growing up there, and so I was very very uh, lucky to to be in that situation with Bobby Cox and Freddie Gonzalez and um, and Brian Snicker, and then that came to an end. I got an opportunity to be uh, with Buck Showalter in in Baltimore for two years. So, um, you know, looking back. You know, I thought as a player, I said, I absolutely will never be a coach. I, said, I, 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 told, I told the coaches, the pitching coaches, you know, whether it was Mel Stoudemire or Dick Bosman or Johnny Padres, Ron Paranoski, I'll never be a pitching coach. I can't do what you do. 
And then when I got out of the game, I was like, I can't not want to do what they do because I really enjoy the game that much and feel that I have something to give back and, and experience and knowledge to offer young pitchers as they you know, try to uh, hone their craft and feel comfortable or uncomfortable as I did when I was a young player and never try to forget what that felt like. Well, hopefully if it's what you want, we'll see you back on the field someday. And however it works out, it's always great having you back here in New York, Roger. Well, thanks. It's, it's great. And, uh, you know, thank you. Thank uh, Jay. Thank the Mets for the, uh, the opportunity. This alumni uh, gig is not, I'm not talking about for me, but I think for the fans is really, really a tremendous thing. And I think it's really a good thing that the, uh, the organization's doing. He speaks of Jay Horowitz, and I would recommend that Jay check the back of his shoes because nobody gets out of here in one piece. Roger, thanks again. All right, Howie, thank you. Pleasure going one-on-one -on -one with Roger McDowell. I'm Howie Rose. We'll see you next time.